Hello, everybody. Hello, and welcome once again to the Secrets of the High Demand Coach podcast. And I'm here with a brand new friend of mine, the one and only Paige Arnoff Fenn. She's the founder and CEO of Mavens and Moguls, which is a global branding and digital marketing firm whose clients range from early stage startups to Fortune 500 companies. You and I are going to have a fantastic com uh, conversation about that, uh, including Colgate, Virgin, Microsoft, New York Times Company, all of them, right? And she was formerly the VP uh, of marketing at Zipcar and VP of marketing at Inc.com, two names that we've all heard of. And prior to that, she held the title of SVP marketing at Launch Media, which was an internet startup that later sold to Yahoo. So, wow. Welcome to the show, Paige. I'm so glad that you're here. I'd love to start uh, off with just hearing the rest of the story. How did you get into what you're doing? How did you make that transition from VP of marketing to, to doing what you do now, helping others? Well, Scott, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here today. Yeah, it's been a very circuitous route. Uh, when I graduated from business school, I joined Procter & Gamble which is kind of like the mecca of marketing, the biggest consumer products company in the world. They invented the concept of brand management. They're number one or number two, and or maybe one and two in every category they compete in. Uh, Charmin toilet paper, bounty paper towels, Pantene shampoo. I mean, you name it, they are tied, pressed. They are the top in every category. Wow. So I really learned about marketing at the at the mecca at the very center of power um which was a great foundation um and i spent the first three and a half years of my career there um i uh also was the assistant chief marketing officer at coca-cola uh, which is the most recognized brand in the world so the first chapter of my marketing career was really in big fortune 500 corporate marketing gigs then my next chapter I was the head of marketing at three dot coms, three internet, you know, venture backed startups. One was in Los Angeles, two here in Boston, where I am now. They all either went public, were sold, or both. So I call them my three base hits. I made a little money three times, but I did not work for Google or Facebook or, um, you know, LinkedIn or any of the one. You know, I'm not Sheryl Sandberg. I didn't make two billion dollars, but I made. A little money three times and that was great and then about 20 years ago i started my own company hung out a shingle mavens and moguls and we're like you said a, a virtual marketing department for companies that need access to great marketing talent on an outsourced as needed basis so that's kind of how i got here like i said uh it makes sense looking back but at the time i had no idea the path i'd be on i love that i love that so let's let's dive in here a little bit because uh, for you know it's rare to find someone who is equally capable in the entrepreneurial startup world and the Fortune 500, right? And and uh, you know it's it's obvious again looking back on it uh, that your experiences would bring both of those to bear. But uh, how is how is it different? I would say first and foremost, working in those two spaces. What do you find are the big differences? So it's interesting. When I was in my corporate life, I realized now looking back, I was very, uh, I was always trying to bend, break, or change the rules. <laughs> I was not a rule follower at all. And I always thought of myself as like a future Meg Whitman. I was going to be a Fortune 500 CEO and run a big multinational corporation. That was the path I thought I was on when I went to business school. Now, looking back, I'm amazed I was as, as successful as I was in that corporate part of my life, because like I said, I was always the one my bosses would all tell you she's really smart, high energy, can do. But God, is she a pain in the ass? Like you give her an assignment and she never just accepts it at face value. She's always trying to be. What about this? Have you thought about that? Wouldn't this be a great idea? Maybe we should try this. Now I realize I was very entrepreneurial in a corporate setting. So I think the seeds of this were in me all along, but I didn't recognize it because I thought I wanted to be Meg Whitman. So um, that's kind of funny. Now that I had all that kind of corporate training, the hierarchy, the process, all the training, I think it's made me a much better entrepreneur because I have that foundation. I have the grounding. I did all the training 
in companies that really invest in you and develop you as a manager, as a leader. And so now I know the shortcuts you can take to save money, to save time. You know, at P&G, to do market research would easily take six, nine, even 12 months to put a survey out into the market. It had to be statistically significant. You know, you had to track and measure and slice and dice. My clients, two thirds of them are early stage to emerging market firms, 2 million to 200 million in revenue. They don't have six to nine, 12 months. If they did, the market would have changed so much, it would be completely irrelevant. So we're throwing out Survey Monkey, Zoomerang, we're doing quick and dirty research, and we're constantly iterating and pivoting and learning and tweaking. And that's what my clients have to do to be successful. But honestly, I think if I were back at those big corporate jobs today, I think they're having to be scrappier too. I don't think they can take that kind of time anymore. Internet time affects everybody. So yeah. I think um, kind of a long-winded answer to your very tight question, I think my corporate life made me a better entrepreneur and my entrepreneurial life was always buried deep inside. I just didn't recognize it at the time. Yeah, that's fascinating. Now you've had uh, you've plenty of experience in this. I think you've been doing somewhere around 20 years. You've been leading uh, uh, your organization there and you know, then the season career before that. So what mistakes do you see uh, folks making? Because one of the patterns that I see, uh, I'm going to ask this in two different ways, but the, one of the patterns that I see for young entrepreneurial organizations is to go out and like find a professional. And that comes across all kinds of different, you know, ways and shapes and channels. It could be a professional accountant. It could be a professional, uh, you know, uh, marketing person. It could be a professional recruiter or whatever it may be. Uh, and they see Coca-Cola on their website or they see, you know, Procter and Gamble on their website. And they think this person must know their stuff. Uh, but then it doesn't work. Right. A lot of times, you know, those folks who who succeed in those larger environments, you know, try to stuff them into shoes that don't necessarily fit. Did you, you know, uh, you know, and feel free to answer this however you'd like, but what mistakes do you see people making trying to apply the world of big business to entrepreneurs? So, you know, I think part of the entrepreneur entrepreneurial journey is making mistakes and learning from them and pivoting and getting smarter and better with every twist and turn. So I am a big believer, not just because I am someone who companies can outsource to, but I outsource the things that are not core to my strengths. I don't do my own accounting. I don't do my own bookkeeping. I don't do, you know, I, I have a web developer that built my website. So if it's not something that you love doing, that you're great at, that's a great use of your time and skill set. Bring in people that do it, that love it. You can pay them, get out of the way. And they will, you know, I don't do my own payroll. I outsource that. It, it really does save me time and money so that I can put all my energy into the things that are really my personal strengths where I can hit the ball out of the park every time. Mm. So I do think it is important to know what you're good at and hire around your weaknesses and bring in partners who you can outsource to so that you can just scale and grow as quickly as possible without making those rookie mistakes. Yeah, that's fantastic. And uh, again, kind of taking this entrepreneurial world, what, uh, what mistakes are you seeing? If we were kind of zoom into like right now, what, are the, what do you think are the big mistakes that folks are making with their marketing? So the biggest mistake right now We've all been through a lot these past two and a half years. Whatever assumptions you made about your business before the pandemic, whatever research you did, however business was conducted, you know, before March of 2020 is kind of irrelevant now. And you just think about your own habits and practices, you know, where you work, how you work, where you shop, what you buy, what you wear, where you vacation. Like everything about our lives has been upended. Mm. So the this, this single kind of biggest piece of advice I give everybody, my clients and anybody who asks my opinion is, you have got to do market research now 
with your audience, with the gatekeepers, with the decision makers, with everyone in the food chain, because you cannot assume you know anything about what's what's going through their head, who your competitors are, what they're willing to pay, how they want it packaged, anything. So market research today is more important now than ever. Mm. And you just, you can't assume anything. So you need to test and learn. Um, that, that I think is the biggest uh, disconnect that a lot of people make mistakes. They say, oh, well, let's just do this, or it used to work, or let's, you know, let's try this. You're gonna save yourself a lot of time and money if you ask good questions and don't lead the witness. The problem with research is some clients come to me and say, you know, we've done research and people just love our idea. They love it. I don't understand why they're not buying more of it. And I said, oh, well, tell me about your research. And it's, they'll say, well, I talked to my friend, my neighbor, my mother, uh, my, you know, my cousin. They all just think it's great. Well, guess what? That's not research. Those people love you and they don't want to hurt your feelings. They will never tell you your baby's ugly. That is just not the way it works. So make sure you're, you've either brought in an independent third party um, who can really get to the bottom of it, but make sure if you're using Zo Zoomerang or SurveyMonkey, trying to do it on the cheap, ask the questions in a very objective way. Because if you're leading the witness, you're not, it's garbage in, garbage out. You are not going to get good data back. You know, tell yeah. me all the things you love about my product. How does this service help you save time and money? Well, who's going to give you bad feedback if you're asking them in a way and you're kind of, you know, egging them on? That is not research. So be careful with that. Oh, that's so good. And I think what's fascinating is we do the opposite, right? When the pressure turns up, when things get chaotic, we double down on what we think we know, right? We double down on maybe even what the past data said. And it feels like so many things are changing that it, it's almost scary to admit that these fundamental ideas, these fundamental assumptions are wrong as well. Absolutely. Uh, what, what kind of advice do you you give to folks as they're starting out on that process and it feels a little overwhelming and intimidating? So, you know, you have to do it step by step, bite by bite, you know, break it down into pieces. And ultimately, again, what we've learned in this pandemic over the last two and a half years is you do not exist unless you have an online presence. So whether you're a brick and mortar company or not, you have to show up online. When people Google you, what do they find? You know, make sure you, you Google yourself and see if there's any digital dirt out there because you need to know what people are finding out about you. But the, the single most important thing is that you have a, a really great reputation online. So mm -hmm. I always tell people being invisible is a terrible strategy today. Um, you have to you have to show up online and make sure if you're big in social media that all your platforms and profiles tell a consistent story to the website. If you're really snarky on Twitter and you're kind of like a partier on Facebook and you're trying to be real buttoned up on LinkedIn and that, you know, and a comedian on your website, that is very confusing and you are not building trust with your audience. They don't know which version of you is going to show up. Mm. So really, uh, you got to clean up well online. You need to tell a consistent story. And it needs to reflect really what the essence of your core values and your brand are. And you can't stand for everything. Don't pick 10 things you want to be known for. Pick like one or two yeah. and just reinforce it in everything that you do. Mm, and that that is just like a nugget that you can take to the bank. Yeah, it really is. Uh, it's fantastic advice. Uh, so tell us uh, who needs outsourced marketing, right? Uh, and and like, who would you suggest that's important to? And then the second part of it is what do they try before they they bring in somebody? So great question. So I had a marketing professor in grad school that said 
marketing is everything and everything is marketing. And I used to laugh at that. But now that I've been doing it for like 30 years, I think he's right. Um, you know, again, you don't exist unless people think about you. If they, if they have a problem that your product or service will help them solve, and they don't think of you first, it's a missed opportunity. So, you know, as you said in my intro, we work with everything from early stage startups to Fortune 500. Everybody needs uh, a great story. They need the right words and pictures to attract the right audience so that, you know, they can sell more of their stuff. That's the name of the game. So, you know, a lot of times people do try and go it alone. And they can be successful in small ways or in big ways. Uh, usually when people pick up the phone, they, they need help with a couple of things, either their messages, their logo, you know, their tagline, their website, kind of everything under the marketing communications. Maybe they need help with market research, really getting into the heads and hearts of who their customer is. Um, and maybe they just need better publicity. They need PR. They need to be out there um, saying, look at me, look at me, think of me, call me, getting quoted, you know, showing up in articles online, being interviewed, writing articles, showing up at conferences, contributing to other people's blogs. So those are really the reasons why somebody reaches out, picks up the phone or drops me an email. And like I said, they may be able to do some of that on their own. But, you know, with PR, you really do need people that understand how to pitch media. Mm -hmm. um, it rarely makes sense for someone to bring in-house their own publicist. Um, a, a really good publicity person, I always say it's not an expense, it's an investment. Because mm -hmm. for not a lot of money, that person can, you know, work the phones and work the computer and bring in a lot of attention. You get quoted, you know, online, on television, on the radio, at a conference. Every one of those uh, media hits is going to, you know, you put it on your website. It attracts attention. It draws traffic. And that helps you convert people and shorten your sales cycle. Mm -hmm. So. If you're if you hire a good publicist and I only work with people that are really good, it really is a great return on the investment, because if you're spending call it five thousand a month on PR and you're bringing in a couple of new clients every month, that's worth way more than five grand a month to you. You could be bringing in 10, 20, 30 thousand dollars of business from, a, you know, from being quoted and being out there. So it more than pays for itself. Yeah, that's fantastic. All right. So this is the moment we've all been waiting for, right? Uh, and that is the moment where we get to hear your biggest secret. And and uh, I've, as I've done several of these episodes now, I've realized that it's the biggest secret that we all wish wasn't a secret. And so I'd love for you to share what's that one thing that you want our folks listening today, founders, leaders that are wanting to grow their organizations? What's that one biggest secret that you wish that they knew? So I think... You, you don't have to know everything and you don't have to solve every problem yourself. Mm. When you're the leader, when it's your idea, your vision, you can have a great concept. You can bring that idea to life, but you, you aren't going to be able to dot every I and cross every T on your own. It's all about kind of who you know and who you bring along on your team. And I think the best entrepreneurs, the best CEOs I know are magnets for great talent, mm. either internally or in their kind of network. They know who to call. They know who to bring in. They know who to ask the tough questions. And they have people who are cheerleaders and butt kickers. And, you know, they've got an ecosystem around them so that they can be successful. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, you know, it's lonely at the top. When you're when you're at the CEO level, and you probably feel this too, Scott, you know, there are days where you wake up and you're like beating your head against the wall. Like, why can't I figure this out? But you can't figure out everything on your own. But there are a lot of great resources out there. And, you know, sometimes the people that you start with 
are not the ones that are going to grow with you indefinitely. So, you know, you may have mentors or people that were part of your founding team that are not as good at scaling are not as good once you get bigger, uh, you know, and so you just have to trust that you're building the right ecosystem around you um, to kind of be successful at every one of those stages. And yeah. like you, we work with people from small, middle, you know, large, extra large, and there are different challenges and it's different skill sets. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, so very true. Um, you know, one of the things that I tell a lot of my clients is alone takes a long time. It's be okay. Maybe you can do it, right? But should you do it? Uh, and is that really what's in your best interest? So uh, that's excellent advice. Uh, I'm so appreciative that you share that with us. Now, I've, I've worked with enough coaches and advisors and, you know, did my time in marketing as well. And I know that, you know, we have a tendency to spend all our time and our best energy on helping our clients, but can do so at the expense of our own business. So I'm going to have you take off your advisor hat here, your marketer hat, and I'm going to have you put on your CEO hat uh, and tell us for just a moment what the next phase of growth looks like for you and your business. Wow. I mean, you know, if there's anything that I've learned in the last two and a half years is that all bets are off. Um, I have no idea what the future holds, but I'm confident that we built a great foundation. I've got an awesome team. I've got an awesome base of business. And we've been very scrappy and resourceful. We've added a lot of new tools to the toolkit. And I feel very bullish and optimistic that we are going to be relevant for years to come. You know, I'm in my mid 50s and I don't see concept of retirement doesn't really appeal to me. I think I'm going to be doing this for a lot longer. And as long as I'm having fun, I think good things are going to happen. So, you know, my CEO hat is, you know, you've got to, you've got to have a growth mindset and you've got to just continue to learn and experiment and make mistakes and pivot um, because that's where you have the most fun. That's where you learn a lot. And that's where you really figure out what the next new thing's going to be. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Uh, it's such an interesting dynamic of, you know, we want to figure the world out, right? We want to you know, know the answer, but so much of it is exploring the journey as it comes. Uh, so that's, that's excellent. Now, I know that some of our listeners are sitting there thinking like market research, you know, we've never done market research. And we always thought that it was this big six, nine month thing. Uh, and sitting here listening, they're like, oh, I've been doing that. I've been making these assumptions and they're not working out. So if that's the case, uh, how can someone get in touch with you and learn more? So the two best places is number one, my website, mm -hmm. mavensandmoguls.com, M-A-V-E-N-S-A-N-D-M-O-G-U-L-S.com. And you can find me on LinkedIn, Paige Arnoff Fenn. It's Arnoff hyphen Fenn. And as one of my clients said to me, she never can remember you know, I have a hyphenated last name and an ampersand in the company name. She Googles Page and Mavens, and I pop right up. So thank God for uh, search engine optimization. So, you know, with a name like mine, I'm pretty easy to find. It's not like Jane Smith. So when you Google me, you kind of really do find me. So again, figure out what your digital dirt says. If what, what comes up isn't good, you're in trouble. Hopefully, yeah, There's all a lesson right there. Well, fantastic. So mavensandmoguls.com. Uh, you can find Paige on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm sure she'd be happy to help and, and contribute in any way that she can. Paige, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. It's been so fun chatting with you, Scott. Indeed, indeed. And to everyone listening, again, we say it all the time, but your time and attention are the biggest honor that you can give us. And so thanks for spending time with us today. We hope, uh, I hope it had as big an impact on you as it did on me. Uh, and to each of you, we hope to see you next time. Take care.